Hello everyone and welcome to the Dark Matter of the Genome Research Bites webinar. I am very excited today to speak about a fascinating topic, jumping genes in cancer and the brain. And joining us to cover these topics are two great scientists, Dr. Patricia Guerreira and Dr. Angela Matia. Thank you very much for coming. Let me introduce myself. My name is Carmen. I am a field application scientist working for Thermo Fisher Scientific. And here in this association of Spanish researchers in Australia Pacific, um, I am a industry liaison. SRAP is a nonprofit organization. We are around 300 members and we have links with universities and research centers across this region. Our aim is to disseminate science and facilitate collaboration opportunities because we want to contribute to the cultural enrichment and knowledge advance of both Australian and Spanish and therefore European societies. SRAP gets help and support from different places like the Spanish Embassy in Australia, um, the Instituto Cervantes, the Fundación Consejo España Australia, and the Fundación Ramon Areces. Our main objectives are, um, apart from helping each other in STRAP, we want to connect researchers and industry. Um, we want to participate in and influence the Spanish research system via a network of international associations. And in the long term, we want to be a part of changing the Spanish research system. Okay. Our topic today is we are speaking about the DNA. And the DNA is the master molecule that contains the code for and orchestrates life. So today we will, in particular, we will speak and cover uh, a mysterious part of DNA. So this magnificent molecule, the length in one human cell, it's uh, 3.2 billion base pairs. And you may think, well, how big is that? To put it in context, uh, the DNA containing one single cell of your body is longer than you are. And this may blow your mind, but if you combine all the DNA that you have in all the cells of your body and attach them end to end, the length would be about twice the diameter of the solar system. That's huge. Well, it turns out that only a really small portion of this uh, of our genetic information contains what scientists thought to be functional information necessary for the survival of cells, around two or three percent. The rest, the 98 percent, was thought to be functionless, and because of that, it was called junk DNA. But it's impossible not to think, how can so much of our genetic information be junk? Well, surprisingly, just as the universe is not only made of ordinary matter, but mysterious dark matter, our genomes are not only made of genes, but they are also made of repetitive sequences among other sequences. And it's really, really hard not to think what is this other 98% of our information is doing in our genomes. Okay, so well, this, this junk has functions that we are only beginning to understand. A proportion of this junk can jump from one location to another in the genome, and because of this, this these sequences are called mobile genetic elements, transposons, or jumping genes. And you may be not, perhaps you were not aware, but we are surrounded by these mobile entities and we are in part a product of the dynamic dance of these jumping genes. These sequences are found in all living forms, as you can see in this slide, from archaea to human being, and they've made their own way through evolution, shaping, changing, and expanding our genomes in many different, diverse, and beneficial ways. Acting in some cases as molecular sensors between the genomes and the environment across the lifespan of organisms. The sequences can impact the genome dramatically, and they are a significant source of mutations within, within cells. 
So they can be really, really, really bad. Such impacts can be, uh, have been reported in different diseases like hemophilia, uh, cancer, and in some neurological diseases. All right, here's the legend. So we cannot speak about jumping genes without introducing you uh, to this woman. So um, she's, uh, she's considered to be a hero of science. At least I really admire her. She's a woman who discovered, uh, the woman who discovered the mobile genetic elements, a woman who was way ahead of her time and that persisted in her beliefs and work when no one else did. Her research was ignored for a long time, but she ended up having a, a, a Nobel Prize in medicine. She is Barbara McClintock. So joining us are two great scientists, two jumping genes researchers that I had the opportunity and the pleasure of meeting them in, at two world-class labs, very well known in the mobile genetic elements field, uh, run by Jose Luis Garcia Perez and Jeff Faulkner, two amazing scientists that I admire. Um, and then after these two talks, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, please write any questions you have into the um, Q&A section of Zoom. And to finish, we will have a scientific system discussion. So yeah, like in then if you miss anything, don't worry because this event is going to be recorded and it will be available online on YouTube. Stay tuned and don't miss our next event. We will have more SRAP Research Bites coming. Uh, we are organizing a forum uh, in Sydney. The topic is big data, probably available online as well. And we will also have different scientific awards. So if you want any information about that, go to our social media platforms. All right, so now it's time for us to learn about jumping genes with our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Patricia Carreira. She's a research fellow at the Genome Plasticity and Disease Research Group at the Mater Research Institute at the University of Queensland in Australia. Her research focuses on a particular genetic feature uh, shared among several cancer types, activation of mobile elements. She imitates aggressive tumor conditions using cancer models to investigate why mobile elements are activated in cancer and how this activation is influencing cancer progression. Patricia has received her bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in molecular um, medicine in the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And after that, she did a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Granada in Spain. And Patricia is passionate about science communication, community engagement, and gender equity in STEM professions. So she's actively involved in educating the next generation of scientists and has supervised two honors students. And she's also involved in community outreach programs, including initiatives designed to encourage STEM careers in primary and secondary school students and to engage with consumers and donors through the Matter Foundation. Patricia is going to give a talk that, which name is Mobile Genetic Elements in Cancer. The mask regulators. Please, Patricia, take it away. Thank you very much, Carmen. No um, problem. It's all okay. Like we see the presentation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, well, thanks a lot for having me and inviting me today. Um, I really like to give talks about my science and about what the mobile elements are actually doing. And so, um, in this particular case, I'm going to um, to talk about what are mobile elements um, in cancer and why we can consider them the, uh, the mass regulators of uh, cancer progression. First of all, what is a genome? Well, the genome is a little bit like, like a library. Um, 
And this is actually a picture of the library where I used to study while I was doing my undergrad in, in Spain. And I'm pretty sure that that's me. <laughs> um, but apart from that, so the genome is a library. And it's a library in the sense that um, it's all composed of books. And we have fiction books and we have non-fiction books. And in the non-fiction books, we also have um, manuals, manuals of how to build things. And, uh, and that is pretty much what a gene is. A gene is a piece of DNA that, is, um, that has the instructions to put together the proteins. And the proteins are a little bit like Lego, like Lego figures. Um, and they are the, the proteins are the ones that actually do things. Um, the bit that is actually surprising, it was that when the genome was first, firstly sequenced, we realized that only a very small portion of it were genes. And genes are around like two or five percent of our genome. So more genetic studies only focus on this part. Some will include this 2% and some non-regulatory elements. So it will make the total size of the genome analyzed around 20%. And I say analyzed because it actually, all the genome gets sequenced. It's just that all the sequences that are not those get removed from the analysis. So what is the bit that gets removed? The bit that gets removed is mostly repetitive sequences. And more, most of them are mobile elements. And mobile elements are something like around 47% of a human genome. And they are everywhere. And this is a depiction of uh, the um, genome browser that we normally use in genetics studies, where we see like a portion of the chromosome eight, and like we see like all these blue bars that are annotated genes, and all these gray bars are mobile elements. And you can see that they are everywhere. So what is a mobile element? So a mobile element is pretty much a piece of DNA that is able to, oh, sorry, it's a piece of DNA Okay. It's a piece of DNA that is able to move, to copy itself and move somewhere else. And the result is that we end up having lots of them. We have a lot of them. So the main thing that happens in a cell is that their activity needs to be restricted. And it needs to be restricted so that we don't end up having this. That is a gene, like a manual, of a piece of Lego that ended up being something that it was not supposed to be. So because the activity is very restricted, where does it mobilize? Well, mobile elements pretty much mobilize only in three, in three, in three points, in the, um, during the embryonic development, in the brain, and in tumors. And when I say tumors, I say many tumors, because pretty much we found mobile element activity in pretty much all of these ones. And mobile element insertions in pretty in breast, uterine, neck, kidney, uh, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, liver, prostate, pancreatic, colon, lung. So we have mobile element activity pretty much in all tumors that we have identified, apart from very few, like some uh, brain tumors and stuff. So what are they doing? Well. The mobile elements rarely initiate the actual tumor. So there is only three instances where we can find the mobile element mutation to actually be the cause of the tumors. Uh, most of the times they seem to be like a, just a passenger mutation, something that happens while the tumor progresses. But even though they are rarely initiating the tumors, they can actually affect the patient's outcome. And this is a paper that we published a couple of years ago where we identify a mobile element insertion in, a, in an ovarian cancer patient that um, end up having a worse outcome that it will be predicted by the mutation profile. And that was because this particular insertion um, inserted inside a gene and modified the way that the gene was, was working. And how, it, how this happens. So um, we have this insertion that it was within this gene that is called the STC1 gene. Um, and the insertion seems to be in the middle of nowhere. It's in between two pieces of information, like this in this region that is supposed to not do anything. And the first thing that we saw is that this gene was actually changing in the copy number. So that means that we normally have two copies of each gene in every uh, genome. And what we saw in this, in this patient is that in all the tumor samples um, that are here depicted as T0 to T4, um, the number of this gene was not the same. So we actually are losing copies of that gene. Um, but we also saw that the amount, the 
out of those uh, copies, most of them were actually the mutant allele. So it, it was basically most of the copies have the mutation. So what is, why is this important? Well, because with the mutation, we are actually increasing the expression of this gene. So this gene goes from like having very low um, activity to actually be quite highly active. And that activation meant that these tumors became resistant to treatment because that is what this, tum what this gene does. It prevents the, um, it actually provides resistance against the chemotherapy that is normally used in an ovarian cancer. These type of mutations were not analyzed. So when the patient was receiving the treatment, they didn't know that that treatment was not going to work, that that treatment was not going to be effective because that patient had a mutation that it was going to do this. And the reason why it's not, uh, why they didn't know this is because genetic elements, mobile genetic elements get removed from the genetic analysis. So another thing that is quite important in mobile elements is that we don't see the mobilization everywhere and all the time in tumors. Um, what we actually see, and this is like two um, very groundbreaking papers. This one was published by Lee et al. in Science in 2012, and this one was uh, published in Science in 2015 by Tubio. And they actually analyzed a lot of tumors and a lot of cancers. And they saw that different tumors have the different abilities to mobilize mobile elements, and also that even within the same type, you have massive difference, like in tumors that are way more susceptible of mobile element activity comparing to other ones. And this, and this is a case in colorectal cancer, but in lung cancer is like, it goes from like something like around a thousand new mobilization events to none. So why? does this happen? Why are things that are different? Why not all the tumors behave the same way in terms of mobile element activity? Well, we have to go back to the library. So I said at the beginning of this talk that the genome is like a library. And we have this library with all these books that have mobile elements books, uh, they have um, manual genes books, and we think about it and all the cells of our body have the same library. That is what is supposed to be our genome. But not all the cells of our body are the same. And so not all the cells of our body use the same information. And that is when it becomes a reality. And the reality is that every single library that we have in one particular cell doesn't have all the books available. It's a little bit like in Harry Potter, we have a restricted section. And this restricted section limits the books that we can access, the books that we can read in each particular cell. But it doesn't happen in a very strict Harry Potter sense. It's not that the restricted section is like one portion of the library, like a standard, one particular space. It's more like in every bookcase, in every shelf of the bookcase, there are different books that we can access or not. And that is how the genome is regulated. How, that is how we can decide which books are we going to read depending on what type of cell we are. And this is relevant because in a body, we actually have multiple cell types. And, uh, and in here is kind of like the, the most common ones. And so um, I'm pretty sure that by now you all have uh, heard about the stem cells that are the cells of our body that are able to create everything else, every other cell type. So a stem cell can create more stem cells, but it also can create specialized cells. And this moment, this process is called differentiation. So we have a stem cell that is something that can be whatever, and it became, it starts modifying itself to create cells that are different. All the cells have pretty much the same genome, but they are using different books. So the library is the same, but the books are different. And when we think about this in a body context, it looks like, oh yeah, cool, it's, it's, it seems easy. This is a neuron, uh, this is a blood cell, so all pretty straightforward. But let's think about a, a tumor. What is going on in a tumor? This is going on in a tumor. In a tumor, we have lots of different cell types. And so we have like the normal, the normal tumor cells, that it will be like these green ones, but then we also have like tumor stem cells and we have, um, immune cells that are regulating the, um, how our body interacts with the tumor. And we have 
uh, cells that are becoming mobile and they're able to migrate somewhere else. And then when they migrate somewhere else, they are going to be able to convert into something else. So we have multiple different cell types and each one of them, the library that they are accessing is different. As a simplification of this, I'm going to use this slide, okay? So in this slide, we can imagine a tumor. This is like the normal tissue. This is the tumor tissue. So something has happened that has modified this. So between these ones and these ones, we have different books available. And this is able to modify itself again and became something else that is able to mobilize and become the original tumor again. So all this process is not a static, it's a transition. The cells can modify what they are from one point to the other and back again. And so that is the process of differentiation and the differentiation. And so why is this relevant with mobile elements? Well, because in a very um, amazing, I would say amazing paper, it's one of my favorite papers for the last five years, um, Jakovic et al. in 2017 described what for me, it was like the crucial point in mobile genetic biology. That is, that in the process of early development, early embryo development, that is very similar to what happens in a cancer, that is like you have a cell and you have to become like a whole new body. And, um, and in the tumor, you have a cell that is the cancer, the tumor cell, and it's, it's going to become the whole tumor. They found that in that process, if you actually stop the transcription, like the generation of mobile elements, of, of the, if you stop the activity of the mobile elements at that very early stages on, the cells cannot progress into becoming an embryo. And they saw that this is completely related with the activation of the mobile elements. So if they stop the activation of the mobile elements, the cells don't become an embryo. And that is relevant because they saw that this is like that because they are regulating how the cells are making which books available. So as I said at the beginning, the mobile elements are everywhere. They are everywhere in the genome. They are among genes, they are in between genes. And so it looks like the activation of certain mobile elements are actually influencing how they are behaving, the genes that are around them. So right now, the question that is open is, does this happen in cancer? Because if it does happen in cancer, and that is what my research is doing, I'm using um, in vitro models where I induce the cancer to become very aggressive, and then I check if I activate the mobile elements, which I do, and then if I check if, like, if the activation of these mobile elements changes the, 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 uh, the way that the genes around them are behaving, I'm trying to, you know, to, to see if like, it changes the way that the uh, DNA is folded in itself. I'm checking, basically I'm checking, is the mobile elements coordinating which books are available? If that, is, if that is true, if that is happening in the same way that it happens in early development, we have two things with mobile elements. We have a prognosis marker, because we can identify which are the tumors that are going to be more likely to metastasize, to move somewhere else in the genome. But we also have a therapeutic target, because if we can stop the transcription, we are stopping the cancer. We are stopping the progression of the cancer. And so these are the really big questions that we are working on now. And, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. We will have the chance to ask you questions at the end of uh, both talks. Mm -hmm. And now we are going to um, ask or welcome Angelina to, to give her talk. Um, Angela Macia is a postdoctoral researcher in Dr. Alison Modri's laboratory at the UC San Diego. She did her PhD in biomedical sciences at the University of Granada, Spain. Angela has a strong background in transposable elements, but also in human-derived stem cells. She uses patient-derived neurons and 3D organoids to investigate how transposons may contribute to, the neuro to neurological diseases, such as autism spectrum disorders. And her research in transposable elements was supported by the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation with a Young Investigator Grant. Understanding how these viruses may affect the human brain, Angela also has been involved in novel research studies as, the, uh, as with the Zika virus disease in 2017 and with COVID-2 in 2020. 
Angela is passionate about creating opportunities uh, for women and girls in STEM, and she has been volunteering as committee chair for the Association for Women in Science in San Diego since 2017, and more recently as a board member. Besides working in the lab and her volunteering work, Angelina also enjoys traveling, reading, and cooking. Angela's talk is Transposable Elements in Healthy and Diseased Human Brain. Please, Angelina. Proceed. Thank you for having me. Uh, My pleasure. Really the opportunity uh, to share a little bit about what we do in the lab, uh, since uh, you know transposable elements is something that is not really well known. And I really enjoy Patricia's uh, presentation. It was like really clear and fun to represent a transposable yeah. element. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna start really quickly. I'm gonna go uh, a little bit more in detail about uh, the different type of transposable elements and what do they do in the brain and the implications. So um, yeah, please ask me if uh, you know I go too much in detail. Uh, you know, you guys can ask anytime. So um, I'm just gonna uh, start with the the theory of the selfish DNA or junk DNA. So as Carmen mentioned earlier, I think that we always had to mention uh, this lady. She was uh, amazing because she basically started describing something that no one has seen before. And in 1956, uh, she described for the first time the idea that mobile DNA um, was present in genomes through our experimentation maze. Um, she was uh, basically, uh, this refuted the popular genetic theory that genes are fixed in a specific position in a chromosome. Um, in fact, several years after Orgill and Creek, they were saying, okay, so a piece of selfish DNA has two different properties. Um, they, uh, it arises when a DNA sequence is pressed from forming additional copies of itself within the genome. Okay, but then the second theory was, okay, it makes no specific contribution to the phenotype. But as uh, Carmen mentioned in her presentation, uh, transposable elements are everywhere, are in different species. We, it's not only humans. Uh, as you can see in this schematic, we have transposable elements can be found in all living forms, including archaea, uh, bacteria, plants, and animals. So you see that there's like different representation of the different transposable elements, and we have different types. Um, depending on the, on the species. So I'm gonna go a little bit more in details a little bit later uh, that we can find basically two types of uh, transposable elements, uh, DNA transposons and DNA and retrotransposons uh, that can be divided into two subtypes. So uh, this is basically uh, the, the, uh, how diverse transposable elements are. You know, in your, in your mind you think, oh, they're just repetitive sequences and they're just a bunch of nucleotides, uh, but they have a specific structure. So we have uh, actually DNA transposons that in the human DNA, they, it represents approximately 3%, and they have the property of cutting themselves from a specific uh, sequence in the genome and pasting themselves. That's why we call it cut and paste uh, mobilization. And then we have the retrotransposons. Inside of retrotransposons, we have the autonomous and the non-autonomous. Autonomous means that they can uh, make their own proteins and use them to mobilize. To mo to mobilize. Um, and then the non-autonomous, they will need the proteins made from these other elements to make more their own mobilization. So for autonomous, we have LTR retrotransposons. These guys are uh, approximately 8% of the human genome and they like, they have that structure that looks kind of like a virus. You know, they have like this polymerase section and they have an envelope uh, and they have long terminal repeats. Then we have the non-LTR retrotransposons and they are approximately 30% of the genome. Um, and the thing that I wanted to highlight, and this is what we're gonna be talking for the rest of the presentation, is that um, these uh, line one elements are the only active autonomous uh, transposable, uh, transposable elements in humans. Uh, uh, for example, we have 3% of these and 8% of these, but they're, they don't move anymore. They are not able to uh, copy themselves and insert themselves in a different region. So um, what do we know, uh, how do we know that line one is active in humans? So the first person that discovered this, uh, it was a MD, a Hick Assassin, uh, that uh, we had the opportunity to, to know in person and he's a great scientist. And he was, um, 
he was really surprised because one of his patients has a, had hemophilia A, which is a genetic disorder. You need to inherit that uh, disease from your parents. However, you know, none of the parents had it. So then he wanted to investigate what was happening, and he looked his sequence, basically, that uh, the gene of the coagulation, and he found that there was a piece of line one in certain in the middle of the gene and that was causing the hemophilia and actually they were able to found the precursor line one that was coming from the mom uh, so this was kind of like he's kind of like the grandfather of the line one um, uh, element uh, field he was basically the one that was saying hey there's something like moving humans and this can cause, cause disease in fact there's been reported at least 130 individuals with various diseases from Duchenne's muscular dystrophy thalassemia and cancer as um, Patricia was mentioning so um, yeah so what um, both Carmen and Patricia were mentioning is that we have little amount of uh, in part of the human DNA that is made of genes we only have like one to two percent. Um, however, we have more than fifty percent that is made from repeated of repeated DNA, and specifically specifically for line one, we have around seventeen to twenty percent, and these are in actual number of copies around five hundred thousand, which is a lot. Um, so this is the structure of the line one element. Uh, we have like a five prime UTR, which a promoter which contains a promoter, a sense and an antisense promoter. We have two open reading frames uh, that I will. Uh, talk about a little bit later uh, what they do and basically they're around 6 kb long uh, so what they do they just jump they transcribe into an rna and then using their proteins uh, they can reverse transcribe they make a copy of themselves and they can integrate in a different region in a different chromosome or in the same chromosome so basically the mother is duplicated, the mother element is duplicated by birth transposition. That's how we call it when they can mobilize. So uh, you wonder, okay, so are these elements, 500,000 copies inserted, no, like non-stop in the genome? No, they're not. Basically we have mechanisms that try to stop those uh, sequences to ha for happening. So only between 80 and 100 copies are birth transposition competent, so they're able to uh, copy themselves and insert themselves in a, a different region of the genome. So uh, line ones have succeeded for the last 160 million years in the human genome. So the human genome contains several line ones of families that accumulate mutations over time. So what is happening is that the, it creates, so the host, which is our cells that try to inhibit this mobilization. So then line one, it somehow like creates a new mutation in the sequence and they're able to be active again. So basically our um, genome is kind of like, it tells a story of the different language of families that we had in the past. So uh, these old languages become molecular fossils, unable to mobilize. However, they're being continuously replaced by new languages of families, promoting the expansion of active language elements. So, um, yeah, so all these copies are still like are successfully inserted. And as uh, uh, Patricia was mentioning, mentioning, it can insert inside of a gene, uh, but it can also insert another part of the gene. The, the, the gray boxes represent the gene with the exos and the intrans. And yeah, line one can insert everywhere uh, from in causes and exonization and alternative splicing, changes of the promoter effects, um, and epigenetic regulation or premature polyvinylation. So basically, yeah, can uh, insert randomly and in principle can create disease. Um, so this is like a um, more specifics about how line one can mobilize. Uh, really quickly, um, I was mentioning earlier that the line one can be transcribed into an RNA and these um, sequences are able to produce their own proteins. So they're gonna, these proteins are gonna be binding preferentially to the RNA in cis preference and make this complex called ribonucleoparticle or RMP. And these will go back to the nucleus and using the endonuclease that is in their sequence will make a nick in the bottom strand and using the RNA as a template will start copying themselves. And uh, by, a, by a mechanism that is not fully underst understood, it will create the second strand and it will integrate in a new region. So um, another, uh, theory that because this is just a model and what we're seeing there's a trend 
that people are starting to see um, Langwand fragments present, this, present in the cytoplasm. So we don't know exactly where these uh, fragments coming from. So what is possible that might happen is that there's somehow a creation of new Langwand copies in the cytoplasm uh, without a primer, which will be really rare. Or maybe that the transposition events are not being completed and then instead of being inserted, they are uh, like transported back to cytoplasm. So I wanted to mention this because I will mention a little bit uh, later about one of the models that we see that this is happening. So this whole model of retrotransposition is not really if, if, um, it's not really efficient. So as I mentioned, there's going to be mechanisms that um, uh, our host, our cells are going to try to avoid uh, and then are going to allow for the line one to jump. So there's mechanisms of methylation of the promoter of line one and other epigenetic mechanisms. There's also regulatory proteins that are going to try to interact with the, with the mRNA, uh, regulating the transposition, and there's also host factors that regulate at the post translational level. So the host is continuously trying to avoid the new insertions. So Lang1 elements have evolved to avoid the disinhibitory mechanisms raised by the host. Uh, and as Patricia was mentioning, what is Lang1 activity highly detected? Um, so it's happening mainly during embryogenesis and in selected normal tissues, uh, which is in the brain and in tumors. This is what is mainly highly detected. So the, the fact that we always talk about selfish DNA or um, it's something that we always imagine that looks like the virus. So we want is an element that tries to survive in our genome. So if you can create more copies of, of itself, it can spread to the progeny. This is something that you want to like has successfully uh, do every time. So if you have a new retrotransposition event in a germ cell or in the embryo, then you can transmit that to the new generation, which will make sense. However, in the case of the brain, it's a little bit different because if, if there's a new insertion when you're an adult, that actually happens in, in healthy brain, adult brain, what is the meaning of that? What is the evolution for uh, meaning of you know brittle transpose in the brain um, so what we think is basically is creating some kind of uh, variability right so line one activity seems to be a concerned process responsible for generating variability within uh, neural genomes so there's always going to be the environment that is going to be contributing to um, to the, the, how our genome changes but also it looks like these somatic insertions of line one can also make an, uh, an effect on our brains. So our brain is a mosaic generated by line one activity uh, and other elements uh, where every single cell has its own genetic content contributing to the brain plasticity and then tells the dogma of what is called the selfish DNA. So recent studies have shown that line one plays a role in the development of central nervous system and neurodegenerative diseases and mental disorders. So um, we not only have found that line one can insert and transpose in healthy human brain, but it's also happening in, this, in disorders like Rett syndrome, ATM, frontotemporal global degeneration, schizophrenia, and even post-traumatic stress disorders. So this is um, a schematic of how there's several disorders that are happening throughout our entire life that are, have been described with having an increase of line one prototransposons, not only copies or maybe an increase of cytoplasmic copies. So it's, they're somehow related to different disorders. And, you know, I think that one of the, the, my goals is like to find out what is happening and, you know, why. So I'm going to put an example of one of those disorders and, you know, how can we model these? How can we see these in the lab? So I wanted to see a practical way of seeing how Lang1 can affect um, a disease. So uh, Ecardigotier syndrome uh, is an early onset non-inflammatory disorder. It's really, really rare. Um, some of the symptoms is microcephaly. This is something that is important that I'm going to mention something later. Uh, seizures, skin lesions, uh, lack of a progress of motor and social skills and uh, lymphocytosis, that, which is normally happens when there's an infection, but in this case, in, the, in this disorder, there's not any, any type of infection by a virus. So um, I also wanted to mention that these um, 
um, disorder caught my attention because um, when I when I moved here to the United States and I started working from the from for the Montreal lab, um, the a PhD student that was working in the lab was actually working in this disorder, and I thought that he was really talented, and I love that he was working in this disease because this is kind of like a really good example of how Lyme ones and disorders are interconnected. So, um, a cardiogotier, there's around six types of uh, cardiogotier syndrome due to six recessive mutations. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about TREX1, it's a three prime exonuclease one. So what is the function of this gene? So this gene basically is an exonuclease. What is the meaning of exonuclease? It basically breaks down those on the DNA, single on the DNA from retroviruses and retroelements. So um, this TREX1, when it's, uh, when it's mutated, when there's a uh, loss of function, the, it loses the ability to break down the nucle uh, nucleic acids. So it, in the unaffected cell, there's gonna be increase of single strand in the, uh, DNA and double strand in DNA in the cytoplasm of the cells. When TREX1 is present, um, there's gonna be that breakdown of nucleic acids. But then when the TREX1 is mutated, then there's gonna be an increase of that single strand in DNA and accumulation. That is gonna create a response from the cell and it's gonna detect like something is happening. It looks like there's a virus or something that is um, not good for the cells. So it's gonna produce an interferon response. So um, the good thing is that how can we model these disorders? So now we have a lot of tools. Now we have iPSCs, which are cells that we can get from patients. We can get fibroblasts from patients and re uh, reprogram those into uh, iPSCs. Or we can use um, wild type or healthy cells and use CRISPR. Uh, with CRISPR technology, uh, now we can create a lot of uh, genetic mutations. And in this case, we can create indels or we can create um, stop codons and we can actually mimic that mutation that we see in patients. Um, having an iPSC is, is basically a great tool because it's gonna help us differentiate to different cell types. Uh, in our case, in, in my lab, we basically differentiate to uh, neurons, astrocytes, and we can also make 3D organoids. So it's gonna mimic what is happening in the brain, in the early development of the brain. So uh, when we um, actually make these uh, cells, we actually found um, that there's an increase of line one elements in the cytoplasm of the cell. If you guys remember what I explained earlier, there's gonna be uh, instances that there's an increase of line one copies that are not in, in being um, uh, inserted in the genome, but it's gonna be kind of like floating in the cytoplasm. So when this mutation is present, there's gonna be an increase of those cytoplasmic copies. And uh, we can also visualize it in a single strand of DNA matter. And we see in NPCs and neurons and in astrocytes that there's an increase of that single strand of DNA and uh, accumulation of line one copies in the cytoplasm. So how can we prove that this is actually, uh, you know, that uh, line one might be involved in the phenotype of the cells. So we are going to use uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These inhibitors are used for HIV and they're also um, um, detected that they can prevent retrotransposition. So the, what they're going to do, they're going to stop reverse transcription and we're going to use um, this cocktail of 3TC and D4T that basically we're calling RTIs uh, for the rest of the uh, Im images that I'm going to be showing. And then we're using something that is not actually in heat line one. Uh, line ones are over here. And basically, um, these drugs are going to inhibit line one activity. And then we're going to use a negative control that is not going to inhibit line one. So. Um, the first thing is like, okay, let's try to model first the disorder. Can we model HDS in a dish? So we actually, we generate uh, 3D organoids and then uh, they were able to see that wild type and TREX1, they were completely different when generated the organoids. They're actually mimicking the microcephaly phenotype seen in patients. Um, then when added the reverse transcriptase inhibitor that is gonna inhibit line one, activity, we see an increase of the size, but when we use a negative control, like nevirapine, that is not inhibited line one, it doesn't change the, the size compared to, um, it's compared to basically the TREX1 mutated. 
in addition uh, of the size, uh, uh, they quantify also the, um, the cell death of the cell. And we, when this um, gene is mutated, when tra trace is mutated, there's an increase of uh, toxicity. Um, there's an increase of apoptosis. And then when you add the reverse transcriptase inhibitor, it's decreased, and it goes back to the same level of TREX1 when we add uh, nivirapine, which is, it doesn't inhibit LAN1. So um, then um, at this point, we wanted to see what is the role of each cell type, because um, in an organoid, we're gonna, a cell, uh, brain organoid, we're gonna have different cell types. We're gonna have neuroprogenitor cells, we're gonna have astrocytes, we're gonna have neurons. So uh, at this point, uh, to understand, to further understand what is the contribution of each cell type, uh, they basically look at this toxicity in neurons, um, looking for the apoptosis, the, the cell death of those cells, and then ne uh, neurons, the, where when the TREX1 is mutated, there's an increase of toxicity and is rescued with the RTIs. And then in astrocytes, the interesting thing is that there was an increase of an interferon response. So basically these astrocytes, are not, they're not only, they're not having that much toxicity, but they're generating some kind of cytokine response that is making them kind of like an alert, uh, in a, an alert response. So then um, in order to understand how these astrocytes uh, and cytokines were contributing to the toxicity of the neurons, uh, they collected condition media, just the media collected from the astrocytes and put on top of the neurons that they were toxic. And when you use um, a, a condition media that was pre-treated with the transcriptase inhibitors, this is rescue. So basically, um, this is a summary of uh, this paper. When we are adding reverse transcriptase inhibitors, when TREX1 is mutated, we were able to rescue some of the phenotypes. But when we are not adding RTIs, what is happening is there's an instinct or inflammatory response that is coming from the astrocytes, and this will affect the neurons creating neurotoxicity. So this is a little bit complex, uh, but but yeah, this is what we're seeing, that not only the insertions are being affected, but also the, um, the, there's a cell autonomous toxicity coming from different cells in the brain. So, um, so this is just an schematic of different disorders and how there's different cytokines that are being elevated. So there's so many diseases that we can explore and I'm really interested in investigating. Um, um, it's something that we would like to pursue and understand a little bit more how line one can contribute to this uh, inflammatory phenotype and what can we do and how can we use it use this as a treatment uh, because I wanted to mention that there are transcriptase inhibitors that those are HIV uh, treatments. Those are treatments that are used commonly for people with HIV. So if in case of these disorders, for example, for a, a cardiogotier syndrome, there's actually cl clinical trials that are trying these uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors because in these uh, kids, basically their babies, is really, really lethal. They die really early. So they're trying to see these reverse transcriptase inhibitors are doing something. So, so basically, uh, line ones can be more damaging than we think, and um, their effect is more important uh, than we thought, than they previously thought. So in summary, the uh, aberrant T, uh, transposable element activation uh, is a contrib contributor of a variety of neurological, neurodegenerative, and autoimmune pathologies. The activation of retroelements confer genomic and cellular instability as the transposable elements can disrupt, disrupt coding regions and rewire transcriptional networks, modify epigenetics and trans, transcriptional regulation of a gene expression. Um, and then when, a, when expression of endogenous nuclear acids are upregulated, uh, they ca this can promote a, a response from the host, what we were talking about, the inflammatory uh, response. So it looks like they're reacting similar to a viral infection and it's creating an envir uh, or environmental trigger. So it seems that it might initiate it, be initiated an interferon response. This uh, persistent inflammatory lead to functional abnormalities and disease phenotype. So I would like to uh, thank Alison. Um, because uh, I've been here as a postdoc for a long time, for five years. I would like to um, thank my students, master students, uh, who were here for, for a while, Colin and Orianne. 
And I would like to also give a thank you to Tia Perez. He was my mentor and where uh, Carmen and I met each other. Um, she was the one that basically introduced me to all this line one field, crazy field. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, the different organizations that helped us and for you guys, for the Spanish researchers in Australia Pacific, for having me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Angela. Thank you very much for your talk and for your contribution in the field as well. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to listen to both talks. And yeah, thank you very much. So we are going to jump into the question and answer section. And let's see if we have any questions here. I don't see. Let me see. So, well, I cannot see at the moment, but I can. I can ask Angela a question like, um, oh, well, hold on, we have one. Uh, here I just saw one. So, to make sure that this listener understands, are jumping genes a source of mutation and genetic regulation as well? Yeah. I guess that can be responded by both of you. Go ahead, Patricia. Uh, yeah, that's that's. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's the that's the hypothesis that we have at the moment. So, um, by the look of it, is something that. Um, so, I mean, evol evolutionarily speaking, we have them. So, um, and we have not been able to, like, our bodies were not able to remove them. And that is happening in every other organism. So, from an evolutionary perspective, jumping genes have to have a function, have to have something that is not just a selfish approach. It's like they are doing something. For example, um, in Drosophila, in fruit flies, um, they do the work of the telomerases. They keep the, the ends of the chromosomes. So it was always the question of like, what are they doing in humans? And, um, and so, so far, we saw a lot of the mutations, but we haven't really paid much attention to what were the possibilities that of them like having an actual function in the genome. And so now we are starting to see that um, they have this option of, of being regulating like the way that the chromosome folds itself. And, and, and so that is important because I say, Carmen, the size of our genome is huge. So we actually need to keep it in kind of like a, a, a condensed, a compact way. And the way that it gets compacted is relevant in which are the genes that are going to be accessible, which are the books that we are going to be able to hold. And the presence of the mobile elements everywhere in the genome is actually one of the indicators that points to the possibility of them acting into in, in, in that sense in like creating this escapol, like being kind of like the architects um, of the genome and how the, the genome gets constructed around them. So that is an option. Um, it's also true that at the same time, if you, if, you need, if you need them to get activated to have that function, you also risk having the consequences of their activation and the consequences of their activation are the mutations. Um, so that's why, like, not all, like, for example, we see that certain types of cells are able to express the mobile elements, but like activating them, but they are not, not, they do not have new insertions. So the control of the mobile elements in downstream of their activation is actually working in those cell types. So it's a, it's a, it's a balance in between how much do we need it and how much do we need it at a certain particular point and what are the consequences of them like mobilizing but yeah that's that's pretty much how how they do it it's like it's both um, a source of mutation and a genetic regulation mm -hmm. thank you very much patricia uh we have another question for angela dr macia except these cases that l um that a ones cause neuron disease do you know any positive role of l1 in neuron development 
Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that that's to complement what Patricia was saying. Uh, that basically what in evolution is creating diversity. So we don't understand really well what is happening in the in the brain. Uh, you know, there's uh, this example that they were saying, oh, maybe Pablo Picasso's brain is it constructed different. And maybe he had this way of thinking and painting uh, because there was a specific uh, mutation uh, caused by Langwan that could like interfere in the way that he behaves or that he thinks or he looks at the cells, at the, at the paintings. So, so it's something that we don't really know. We don't know if there's, this is creating an actual variability. Um, in a regular healthy brain, the number of insertions really reduce. Uh, but yeah, if there's any type of like schizophrenia, post-traumatic disorder, um, there's some kind of activation that could modulate and create new mutations that could modulate uh, how we behave. So it's not fully understood. Uh, we know that um, the, those insertions can happen everywhere in the brain, it can happen in, in the hypothalamus and the, the cortex. So yeah, there's some, something that could happen, but we don't understand any positive role. Probably it's just creating possibilities. That's how I understand and how I envision. Like, um, for example, this, this case that they were saying that how um, uh, super species of um, monkeys were able to find a way to create some kind of ball to go to the river and, you know, get some water from it. So, uh, and the other monkeys didn't think about it. So how why this monkey was able to think differently and was like thinking out of the box and go and create a ball to get water from the river. So those are the things that we don't know, really understand. We don't know if this is uh, caused by the variability of language elements, that, but this could be a possibility. Well, thank you, Angela. I know Africa, like, um, uh, it's not um, a mutation that happened in neural development that I'm aware, but there is like a very cool muta mutation that you were mentioning in the monkeys, in all monkeys, um, a transposable element that jump in a region that promoted uh, in the, the VDP recombination that it formed part um, of, it helps in the, uh, to the development of the immune system, no? One of the heavy chains or something like that. So there are like really, um, cool examples of how these jumping genes have impacted different in different manners the the genome and and yeah but still we don't know much no and it's like i i like to highlight a huge challenge for scientists that is uh, finding how how you all the struggle you go through to find these repetitive sequences it's just like finding a needle in a high stack right it's just it's just really, really complex. And I think technology nowadays is getting much and much better. But um, I think the more we uh, get to know how to sequence the genome with longer uh, reads, we will be able to assess and study all of these phenomena in a better way, no? Um, there is another question that we have here. So, Second question to Dr. Uh, Mathia. Is there any examples of transposable element, uh, transposable element transposition in neuron system or other mammals or insects? Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, there's different examples. Actually, during my PhD, a, a colleague of mine, he was using a uh, zebrafish as a model, and he was able to see beautiful uh, line two insertions um, and line one insertions, uh, also, you know, from human inserted in zebrafish. And yeah, you can see how the brain lights up, and it's like pretty cool to see uh, that, yeah, you, you can see that the transposition of the neural system, and actually also Drosophila is well described too. Um, there is another question. It's, it's also relevant to mention in there that different species have different mobile elements active. Not all of them have the same type of mobile elements active. So mm -hmm. the, the mobilization patterns are different yeah. um, between organisms. Mm -hmm. So here we have another question. What is the cause of these deregulated mobile elements in the brain in adults or in, during aging? Yeah, so um, that's the biggest question of the field. Yeah. No? yeah, this is a great question. I think that, uh, you know, how the access of those books that Patricia was mentioning, how the epigenetics of the brain are changing, and how the, mechan the mechanisms that try to stop and control that mobilization is not 
working as, as good. In my mind, is they're kind of lazy as you get old. So they are not controlling that uh, regulation. So, so they are you know, using the opportunity to jump. I don't think that, you know, in some cases, I think it probably will be environmental factors. For example, drugs can cause uh, misregulation of uh, line one elements and, and other transposable elements. Uh, but yeah, for example, um, the use as cocaine, for example, is being described to increase an uh, regulation of line one elements. So, um, so yeah, basically um, during aging, I think what is happening is that those mechanisms that should be regulating are not as good. So their language are just it, taking the opportunity to just jump and be selfish. <laughs> in, in this context, it's also relevant to say that um, in the years that we have been studying mobile elements, um, and this is a field that kind of started in the, in the late 80s, so it's not really, it's quite young. Um, We've learned a little bit about how it regulates, and we learn very little uh, how, about how it activates. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually very difficult for us to to know how it gets activated. Like, what are the signals that the body is, is making to to activate it in normal conditions, just even in a healthy in a healthy situation? Um, and so that is one of the things that we are working on, like it, identifying what is activating the mobile elements and um, and how it's happening. Yeah, and one of the um, really discussed points in like about the activity of these jumping genes in the brain is about what's the rate in which these two elements mobilize in the human brain. No? Uh, and that has been a big source of discussion and but like from estimation from 0.2 in sessions per neuron to 13 or 14. Uh, I think like it's still the fact of the matter is that we have 86 billion neurons in the brain, more or less. I don't know exactly how many, but that's what I've read. And the contribution must be there, right? Um, so it, we have another uh, question here. I don't know if I think um, any of you can respond this one. Do organisms uh, with higher rates of mutations have more active jumping genes? And what are the biggest questions uh, in the field? Sorry, can, can you repeat the question? So there are two questions. Do organisms with higher rates of mutations have more active jumping genes? And the second question with the same person asked is, what are the biggest questions in the field? Well, the, f the first question is like, we don't know. Um, and, and this is just me in an hypothesis, okay? So I, I don't think that necessarily the two things are related. So the, the normal, like what, what we know about mutations, like this, the single nuclear mutations, that is like we basically have a letter in the genome that gets changed into a different letter or like a small deletion or in a small insertion. Um, those ones are normally produced when the DNA gets copied. So it's, it's an error in copying the, the, the genome. So um, organisms that have a higher rate of mutations are normally organisms that, are, that have like a worse mechanism of copying. Um, the mutations of the L1, of the, of the transposome elements, of the mobile elements are independent of that per se. Um, it's true that some of them get corrected by the same mechanisms that will correct the other ones. So we could potentially think that they are going to be more, um, but it's, it's going to be more a question of the balance between is the error because, like, is the mutation rate higher because the machinery that copies the genome is worse or is the, the mutation rate higher because those organisms are, are worse at identifying when they have an error? Yeah, I would like to add uh, to Patricia's comment um, that there's also another possibility uh, of breakage in the DNA. So this is something that it happens in some disorders, but that is not specifically becoming from a, a random mutation in the gene. There's some uh, proteins that basically kind of like <coughs> that those mutations are not happening. So it creates some kind of instability in the DNA. 
and that instability creates breakage. So the breakage in the DNA um, is again another opportunity for line one to jump and to you know have that like um, strand hanging and it's gonna be uh, happily and attaching that uh, mechanism of ribonucleic proteins and it's gonna start creating new copies in certain. So so yeah, when there's a genomic instability uh, created for specific mutations that cannot proofread the DNA, there's an increase of, of insertions. But yeah, in a specific like random mutations like Patricia was saying, it doesn't need to be completely related to it. Mm -hmm. And what do you think are the biggest questions uh, in the field? Still open. There are many, right? Yeah. For me, the biggest question would be: we don't know much. Would be why, like, how they get activated? Yeah. And in a, in a healthy in a healthy context. Mm -hmm. So, what is you know during during the development? What is making them jump? What is making them being active? Why are they active? Why they jump? No, why? Why they get? Why they get activated? So, if we know that the consequences of their activation has potentially disastrous. <laughs> Like, you know, they, they can basically disrupt pretty much anything that they want. So why are the cells letting it happen? So why are the cells letting it get activated? And my only, my, the only thing that I can think of is they actually need it, that the cell needs them. So why? Yeah, I think um, for me it's more uh, what happens if we don't have those elements. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a continuation of what you were saying. So what happened if we eliminate all of them? Uh, in the case of some organisms like yeast, for example, Jeff Buka, he uh, eliminated, he created kind of like a, um, a chromosome, a synthetic chromosome, where he uh, didn't add transposable elements. Uh, to that synthetic chromosome, and those uh, that organism uh, was able to, you know, function normally without transposable elements. But th this was this was in yeast, so it was like yeah. a simple <laughs> organism. So that that's, that's a yeast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't extrapolate to to a complex um, organism like humans. So if we have them, if they're active, what are they doing? So yeah. so yeah, what happens if we eliminate them? So, Why yeah. nature has persist consistently maintained them in such a bigger, like big proportion, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's very, like cells are, are efficient and they try to be really efficient. And the cost of copying 47% of the genome that you're not going to use for anything is ridiculous. It's really high. So you will think that if there is no function, they will not be there. Yeah. Still, some people argue that you have... Um, a structural, structural function of these elements, no? Yeah, that's, like, that's, but... that's a little bit what we are discussing now, the potential that they are actually being, you know, working as an scaffold for everything else to happen around them. Mm, but it will be like creating a castle to live in one, one single room of the castle, right? I mean, um, yeah. I people have big dreams, so maybe cells do also have big dreams. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> this is just like we are divagating here. Um, for so another question the in the forum, yeah. Yeah. Another question for uh, Patricia uh, before we start and with the uh, scientific discussion section. Uh, that's um, how do you think, Patricia, single cell sequencing technology can help us to understand the role of transposable elements in cancer? That's a good question. Yeah, that, that, that's a tricky one, actually. Um, so I, th I think that the I think that the role of, of of transposable elements in cancer is not that much related with how what they do at the DNA level in terms of like where they insert or when they mutate. Although sometimes that that has uh, consequences, but I think it's more related with like what happens when they get activated and what things are making them get activated and what happens if we prevent that activation from happening. And um, in, so that will be more in the, in the realm of um, RNA and not DNA really. Um, and the single cell RNA, well, the single cell technology it still has a lot of limitations. And some of the limitations that we have is that um, we can identify a lot of cells and we can see a lot of cells. Um, but we are also losing a lot of information and it's like so when we see expression of genes we don't necessarily see how the genes are behaving like how the genes are being trans translated into proteins are the proteins going to where they have to go what are the signals that are changing that so um 
I think that we are not at the level where single cell will necessarily provide us that much information. Um, I think that we need to, because the question is so broad by now, we need to go to like really like simple systems that we can control more specifically. Um, and they are and being more homogeneous. I think the single cell is it will be the answer when we when we know what we are looking for um, to go into patients, into patient samples, into tumor samples, and like actually check the heterogeneity of the of the tumor sample. But to answer the questions that we have right now, we actually need models. Like we need to to go at, at a step at before that and and check it in things that are more more homogeneous because otherwise we'll is 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 too many things going on. Well, thank you very much for your responses. And now um, we are going to start the scientific discussion section. And thanks also to the people who may uh, ask uh, the questions. And thanks for your interest. Uh, basically, I would like to, um, well, this is really good to just to give the opportunity to, uh, people who don't do science to uh, have a look and get to know what do you do in the labs and what's your research about and what's your work about. That's the biggest reason why we are here, no? but the curiosity. But also one of the reasons why I like to do these webinars is just to reivindicate um, what's, what's happening with the scientific system because it's really common that I see brilliant scientists that are like every so often really uh, getting out of academia or of research. So I like to ask you, what do you think, um, what do you dislike about this system? What do you dislike? Well, then I'll ask you, what do you like, obviously? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, to just like, what are the biggest challenge that you face doing your research? Because it's, it's really hard. Most, most of the- To recognize your efforts here. Most, most of the challenges are not related with science. And, and that, that is the bit that is, that is tricky. So you, you stay in science because you love the science. So you love the option, the opportunity to answer questions and to, and to you know, create like an, imagine something and see if that is actually happening and, 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 and check that. And that is great. The problem with science is all the, um, and that is the bit that you don't know when you decide to be a scientist is that you will be playing politics. And that is, that is the bit that is terrible. And <laughs> that is the bit that we don't like about science. If, you, if it was all like, oh, the science, we would all be like happy and like really, you know, relax about it. But reality is like, there is like a massive job instability. Our contracts are like two years, every two years. Um, in Australia, people that has a professorship hasn't even have a, a tenure contract. They don't have a permanent position with the universities. Like the moment that the funding ends, that person is out. So you you live with that with that level of job insecurity, and and your chances of guarantee that you're going to have a job at the end of your contract are not related directly to your science. Are related in how well you play the politics game. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is what became, you know, you get frustrated about it. And I think that for me, that is, that is the hate bit. It's like, I love mm -hmm. science. I hate the politics system of science. Well, thank you, Poto. Well, Patricia, uh, like the, uh, the politics system, you mean like just not only, you're not referring them just not only about the instability of the, no, I'm, I'm uh, referring about the whole thing. I'm the, referring about the, how, the quality how the of funding, the contracts. how the funding okay. gets yep. organized. I'm referring about how the university organized, like how the funding gets organized from external agencies, like from the government, but also how the universities are playing the same game. Um, how how your career is controlled at multiple stages, not by you, but by your mentors and your supervisors and how much they like you and how much they promote you and, um, and that kind of thing. And that, and that is the bit that is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. What do you think about that, Angela? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's the same uh, for me, the same view that you don't have a guaranteed job, obviously. I mean, no one has, but I think that you cannot have to play 
that politics part and you know be liked. Uh, that's really important uh, to make sure that you have the right, you know, the right people. It's not only about your science, and um, and that's really sad. And obviously, I mean, science is difficult in the sense that uh, there's a component of luck in the science that you do too. Um, there's gonna be a lot of frustration because uh, experiments don't work, uh, and some projects you're gonna have to abandon. You start many, many when you start your PhD or your postdoc, <laughs> and then only few of them are successful. So, so you know, those are the challenges that as an individual you had to face. And I think that you kind of have to make sure that you're demonstrating this to your mentor and that um, you're being liked and being uh, show your effort. Um, so there's like many, many components to, to this. And uh, now that, for example, I'm, I'm like finishing my post, postdoc and the possibilities of getting a, a PI position, uh, primary investigator are like really, really reduced. Uh, in fact, when you start um, in your postdoc orientation here at UCSD, they tell you that only less than 10% of, of postdocs that enter will get a PI position at the university. Um, and I think that now in COVID times, it's like even more reduced. Uh, yeah, it's like teeny tiny. <laughs> now a lot of universities are not, are not even hiring hiring because you know COVID so so it makes it like even harder you have to play with all these things the luck uh, your research and you know get grants and um, being able to get to the next level it gets like complicated really complicated so yeah it's it's frustrating to see that uh, we cannot continue our careers for things that we cannot control yeah I think that the yes and I think that the bit that we we were never told when we were like doing our PhDs and like or, or at the beginning of when we you know we all got into science because we love the questions and was like oh yeah it's fascinating it's like awesome like doing experiments and all the stuff. What they never told us is that we will have to be writers, we will have to be uh, you know accountants, we will have to be graphic designers, and we will have to be our own PR person and our own marketing person. In that, you know, at the end of the day, science is a, it's a little bit like soccer, all right? And, and this is like a very good example. So you think about the, you know, the biggest soccer teams at Real Madrid or the Barcelona, and you think like, okay, so, you know, who we know in the Real Madrid and well, right now, nobody, because I've been living in Spain, I've been outside of Spain for too long, but in the Barca, so we have Messi, all right? And so everybody knows that Messi plays in Barcelona. So if the Barca wins titles, it's not just because of Messi, it's because of Messi and all the people that is in the team with him. And what happens in science is that basically you have a team that produces like this science that is amazing and only Messi gets the award. That's a great and also the challenge as well of um, the negative results, right? Like no oh, yeah. one publishes negative results. So the system pushes towards publishing yeah, positive you're... results, but negative results are also as important and sometimes even more, no? Well, they are. You're able like... to get to the positive one, you got to go through all the negative ones. So and it, I and was going also... to ask you, how would you improve this system? Um, I mean, no, in, I in terms of the... any idea. In terms of the negative result, it's actually quite relevant because so most of our funding and most of the funding from research comes from government funding or, or taxpayers' money or donations from, uh, from foundations. So it will be in their best interest that it gets invested in things that are going to be, you know, at least like relatively successful, all right? So the problem with not publishing negative results is that if you tried something and it didn't work, probably nobody knows about it, which means that there might be a person somewhere else in the other side of the world that is deciding to do the same thing in the same way that you did it. <laughs> and it didn't work so they are putting money into things that are not working and that we know that they don't work already but the problem is that those results don't get published and and right now it's like you have to have like the newest result with the most innovative way to do it in the um, you know most engaging writing ever and with the best figures yeah, but then and the animations we found that I don't know the stats uh, for sure, but I think I've heard like around 60% of the scientific papers in the top journals like Nature are not uh, reproducible. So that 
I don't think people want to publish crap. I think this is the system is too it's pushing towards that. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, uh, the open source format, I think that is open more possibilities right now because uh, for people that are not in science, I mean, um, the way that we publish our uh, research is through, through journals, uh, scientific journals like Nature or Science or Cell. Uh, if you're lucky enough. Uh, so then uh, basically crap. <laughs> you actually had to pay in the first place you had to pay for that um, for that research to be published in that in that journal and then they they keep the copyright so basically that those images cannot be reproduced outside of the nature or cell or um, whatever format so it, it gets really restrict, restricted and also in order to publish there is really challenging so so it is really hard uh, just because a higher impact factor which is like how they are kind of like divided in the quality uh, yeah. yeah, so, so um, it's better for us if you publish in a bigger impact factor journal, you're going to have more chances to get grants and to have funding in the future. So it's everything kind of like in a circle. Uh, if you don't publish well, then you have less chances to get good funding. So um, now there's a trend of open source format. Uh, actually, I had the experience now with COVID that uh, they ask you, uh, big journals are asking you, please uh, put it in my archive and like an open source format. So is out there and everyone can see because in our case for example we had a treatment that we thought that might work with uh, COVID too so so it's out there right away and people can see it so then uh, you have the accessibility and people and researchers can see it and criticize so we need to start thinking about changing this system and not being so like top tier and try to publish negative results and try to contribute to science and that's what we're trying to do um and yeah you know, it's, the whole world. also because the, the top absolutely the top, the top tier journals apart from the from the retraction rate or whatever um or, or like the reproducibility um it's just a question of like who can afford it so um, there is a massive bias in those um, in articles to publish, like publishing in like the big papers in Cell, Nature, Science, um, towards the same labs and the same universities. And it's because they are the ones that can afford it. And not just they can afford the, the fee to publish the paper, they can afford the, the, the cost of doing the experiments that they are going to be requested. So when we think about like, you know, for example, um, whole genome sequencing that is like very, very cool and stuff, or, or single cell sequencing. Um, sequencing a sample is like, it's a thousand dollars. Now, 10 years ago, that was $10,000. Sequencing one sample. If you try to publish an article in Nature 10 years ago with one sample, they are going to laugh at your face. So you will have to have like at least five or six samples with like replicates and stuff. So we are talking about like $100,000 for an article, like in cost of actually doing the research behind it. Who can pay that? No. And in my that, opinion, also like there is the point of research that has been public, publicly funded, yeah. then is sent to particular journals in which we all as society will need to go there and pay for, to read this paper. Yeah. So it's kind of contradictory. Yeah. Contradictory. But anyway, so uh, to wrap up, thank you very much for your opinions. And, and yeah, let's, I just think it's important to, to speak about this. So to wrap up on a nice um, note, I would like to ask you, obviously like it's doing science is not easy there must be something underlying bigger than, than all of that, just to overcome such a difficult scenarios, no? So what do you enjoy the most of your job? Angela, you go first. I need to think about it. <laughs> Um, I think for me, mentoring is the thing that it fulfills me the most. Uh, I really like, uh, you know, teaching and, you know, motivating my students to keep pursuing what they like and what their, their you know, their dreams and, you know, her, their hypotheses are. Um, I think that I have a really good mentor and, you know, he helped me think and understand how this world works. Uh, so I kind of want to 
like share that also with my students and um, and yeah i really enjoy seeing them like really naive at the beginning and you know little by little you know just you know understanding what they're doing and developing their experiments by themselves and analyzing the experiments so i think that that's one of the things that i feel super proud of and i really enjoy um, so that's one of the things that I will definitely, you know, keep close to me and, you know, motivate myself to continue with science as the mentoring part. And also, I think that the second thing is um, the, those little experiments that you do and they're successful, because I will say that like 90 percent are like <laughs> fail, failure or you need to optimize them. But those 10 percent of experiments that actually work and they keep you pushing because basically science is like keep pushing and you know seeing what is happening and asking more questions that keep pushing and um being frustrated but then that 10 percent keeps you motivated so that's yeah that's a moment of, of science yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. what about you patricia no i was thinking that if, if angela has like 10 percent success right in her experiment she's pretty that's good. a lot no <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was thinking that well, I might have like three three days a year when it's like I'm loving the science and it's like yeah my experiment work and it's like three days a year um yeah I mean I I mean I agree that I, I love the mentoring bit but I think that I I do the mentoring and I do the teaching just to keep me sane um but I, if if I was thinking that just in the science and like the actual just you know research part of my job I would say that the bit that I like is the the ability to to problem solve. Like you're problem solving every day. Like you get you get a question and you think about it and you decide how you're going to design the experiment and you and you you basically decide like you have a question and you figure out what do you have to do to get an answer about it. And like in, in that challenge, that intellectual challenge is, it's like playing Sudokus on steroids every day. And, that, and that's, that's amazing. I love that. Um, and I, I don't think I that love, you can do I it. love the comparison. Yeah, but I, I don't think that you can Very do it cool. anywhere else. And so that, that's the bit that I, I really, really love about, about the science and, and about the research. And then it has other perks, like the, the students are great. Um, getting people, you know, when you, when you actually manage to get a student that you see them coming from the moment where they are pretty much doing whatever you tell them to do to the moment that they stand up for themselves and like say like no i think that your design is bad and it's like yeah that's probably true <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually great like having that mm. but like, that for me the main the main thing is the intellectual challenge the constant intellectual challenge yeah yeah well well thank you very much i think with this um we are about to uh finalize this uh finish this webinar and i'd like to highlight how important is doing basic research no oh, yeah. uh, it is really important for the scientific progress and this is a a good example uh, jump engines are a very good example of, of how studying uh, just like cons has contributed that much to the field of genetics and has shed light to the darknex of the genomes no and with that this uh, webinar has been recorded so it's we it will be available on youtube thank you very much dr patricia Guerreira and dr angela macia it's been a pleasure to have you here and to speak about this fascinating topic thank you, thank you. Bye. Have, have a good weekend you too thanks a lot for having us bye